you know, you, you have this incredible resilience. A very famous guy. I'm trying to remember who it is. Jack Parr. No, no. Yeah, that's good. To, no, but this little stuff. What do you think? No, we I guess I have You're doing better every year. <laughs> <laughs> this book was a departure for me. I didn't intend to write about the Battle of Cowpens. But my husband and I were volunteering up there. And while working with teachers from North and South Carolina on curricular material to address the <coughs> social studies objectives of both states, one of the teachers said, you have all of this research here, and all of these books, and nothing appropriate for a teacher, or my students, or our libraries. And Pat Ruff, who was the chief ranger at the time, said that's going to be Chris's next book. <laughs> and Chris had no intention of writing the next book. But I love that site. And Larry Babbitt's had just published um, A Devil of a Whippin, which was a magnificent um, review of that battle. And I thought, I'm supposed to write that for teachers and young adults? But I decided that yes, I would try it. Now, I'm basically a storyteller. And as I thought about it, I thought, the real story here is militia. Now, I think you all know I'm partial to the militia. And I wanted to tell the story of who those people were. Because at that battle, they stood with the British coming at them, and they held their fire in the face of British bayonets. They did not run. They waited for the order to fire, because Daniel Morgan asked them to. I thought, that's a tremendous act of courage. And I wanted the young people that read my books to know who those people were and why they were willing, willing to do it. How did they feel about all of this? Well, Pat Roth wanted a straight history, expository text. And once you get in the feelings of people, that's fiction. So I decided first, I'll write it in two fonts. I'll write the history of the, store, of the battle in one font, and I will put the voice of the patriot in another font, so the reader will always know the difference. And so, as I mull this over, and I do a lot of mulling, uh, long before I get to uh, the computer, and I sort of had conversations with my characters, especially late at night, and it drives my husband of 64 years quite crazy, but, um, but I do it, and I hear them. And I could hear a patriot voice in my head. Scots, Irish, obviously, and always in poetry. Now, you don't have to be crazy to write the way I do, but it helps to be a little eccentric. <laughs> this is what he was saying to me. See the hills there in the distance, far as the eye can see. This is Carolina country, and this belongs to me. From the crowded ports of Ulster in a stinking ship at sea, I travel ever westward. <coughs> this land belongs to me. <coughs> Down the wagon road I struggled. Through the German pastures green, on the bottom lands of rivers, sure the richest land I'd seen. But in western Carolina, Rivers rush and wild game roam. Trees reach forever skyward. It is here I'll build my home. My cabin will be safe for my wife, my babes, and me. Here I'll die and I'll be buried, for this land belongs to me. That was the mindset of the back country militia. Now, you know from what Dr. Khan said this morning, the Scots-Irish had a long, and contentious relationship with the British. They had been moved from the borderland of Scotland to Ireland in the early 1600s. 
For a hundred years, they had survived, but they had not thrived. They had been, they couldn't uh, join the military, they couldn't aspire to higher education. Their products, uh, linen and woolen, were heavily taxed if they tried to sell them, and they lived practically in virtual slavery. But they endured for a hundred years. They never were assimilated into the Irish society, which is Roman Catholic, because they were Presbyterian. And although their children and grandchildren born in Ireland were Irish, Irish, these people remained Scot. And the more they were insulated, the more Presbyterian they became and the more Scot they became. And in 1700, roughly, the British government, favoring their established church, the Church of England, enacted very harsh laws on the Presbyterians in Ireland because the Church of England wanted to eliminate dissenters. And Presbyterians are dissenters. And uh, the laws were punitive. It was religious uh, persecution. The pastors who did not comply but followed the dictates of their religion were imprisoned and in those early days, a quarter of a million Irish, Scot Irish, left Ireland and came to this country, pursuing religious freedom. They, most of them uh, landed in uh, the New York, New Jersey area, and moved west, reached the proclamation line, and started south. And by the, in, by the time of the revolution, we had thousands of Scots-Irish from northern Georgia to western Pennsylvania. This is the first time that they were allowed to own property. And they were here and they intended to stay. Now, they hated the British and they hated the Church of England and they just a little more than they hated Charleston. Because in Charleston, the English had established the Church of England as the established church of South Carolina, and tax money was used to pay uh, for those churches. But the Spartan district is a long way from Charleston, and as long as those people in Charleston left them alone to pursue their dreams, everything went fine, and they really did thrive. Uh, cleared lands, uh, built homes, planted, built uh, mills on the rivers, uh, traded, and, uh, uh, and, and some with the deer highs and all, um, and they did very well. And in the early years of the revolution, um, they were not much affected, um, inconvenienced occasionally, but things were going very well for them. And then, Things changed when the British established a post at 96 and moved into the back country to recruit for British uh, militia. And expecting that all of these people, these Scots Irish, with all this history, would rush to the flag of the king. What were they thinking? <laughs> However, that didn't happen, and the backcountry exploded in violence. And the ones in the Spartan district, we have Cedar Springs, uh, Earl's Ford, Gowan's Old Fort, Fort Prince, Fort Thickety, and um, the running battle along the old Georgia road through Wofford's Ironworks, Lawson's Creek. And they're fighting. British provincials from 96, and they are doing a very good job of killing, wounding, and taking prisoners. The culminating battle in this series was at Musgrove's Mill in August, where militia took from North Carolina or Tennessee, uh, Georgia and South Carolina, took on British regulars, or British, you know, 
uh, provincials at Musgrove's Mill and decimated a British army. They learned how to deal with the British. You mass the militia and you target officers and NCOs. But at the same time, the Continental Army fell at Camden. The Continentals were gone, and the people in the back country knew that now the British were free to bring the full force of their army into the background, back country, to put down the revolution. And it was a dangerous time because they watched and they waited. And travel was very uh, dangerous. People uh, were suspicious, but they still went on with their lives. Through the uplands down the hollows, do you hear the wind of howling? Deer are fleeing to the deep woods for tonight. The, the wolves are prowling. Cold is seeping through the log chinks, through the windows round the door, and the bitter rip chill is rising from the cab cabin's earthen floor. Come and hunker by the fire, catch the warmth as best you can. We'll share our pearlo in the pot and the cornbread in the pan. Danger threatens in the uplands. Not the Indians as before, now it's Tories who would kill us in this bloody <coughs> war. Yes, there's danger in the mountains. Evil lurks and foes are near. Eat a bit and rest, my friend, for tonight there's safety here. And as they watched and they waited, <coughs> Ferguson finally came. Western North Carolina and threatened the mountain men under Shelby who had really torn them up at Wofford's Iron Works and Musgrove's Mill. And they did as they had done at Musgrove's Mill. They massed the militia from uh, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And you know what happened at Kings Mountain. And now Cornwallis, knowing that his western flank is exposed, he moves back to Winsboro. And the people in the back country waited. And little did they know at the time that Nathaniel Green had been uh, appointed to take over the Southern Army and things would change. Green has been uh, described as having a superior mind and a Herculean memory. Jack Buchanan refers to him as cerebral. And he split his army and sent Daniel Morgan out to the west to annoy the enemy and spirit up the people. And the people he wanted spirited up were militia because Green did not have a strong enough continental army to take on the British and he needed the militia. Now when Morgan went out to the west, Green expected Thomas Sumter's militia <coughs> to fall out and support him, and Thomas Sumter had been wounded, and he wasn't wild about his men taking orders from anybody for himself, although some of them did uh, provide militia support as pretty much individuals and locals um, for, for um, Morgan. But Morgan was in desperate need of help, and on Christmas Day, Andrew Pickens and James McCall showed up at, his, at Morgan's camp at Grendel Shoals and offered their support. Now, Andrew Pickens had been on parole, but just a few days before that, his parole had been violated, and he now was free to take with arms again. James McCall, who rode with him, longtime friend had never taken a parole and had been extremely active at Musgrove's Mill and all of these uh, <coughs> previous uh, engagements and had fought with the, the uh, Wills County Militia from Georgia from the beginning of the war. And Andrew Pickens offered 
to call out militia and command it for uh, Morgan, and Morgan accepted. James McCall stayed, and he accompanied William Washington in an attack on Tories at Hammond Store, and then at Williams Fort. Now, Williams Fort was the palisaded home of James Williams, who had been killed at King's Mountain. And uh, it had been taken as uh, the headquarters for Ferguson. It was 15 miles from 96. And when James McCall and William Washington took back um, that Williams plantation, Cornwallis had that, and he sent Tarleton after Morgan. Um, one author that I enjoy very much, Stokes Berry, wrote, the first few days of January, Tarleton first hunted and then chased Daniel Morgan, and on the 17th of January, he made the mistake of catching him. <laughs> Not a great line. Anyway, with Tarleton in the back country, the word spread. They say that Tarleton's in the Highlands and his British troops are near. There'll be bloodshed in the meadows if Bloody Band gets here. With his troopers riding swiftly, their sabers flashing high. Bloody Band will give no quarter. Those who can't escape will die. And this is the mood of the militia. They were waiting for a sign. And it soon came from Andrew Pickens. Can't you hear your country call you? Come to the cow pens, is the cry. Morgan needs your brave militia, else his flying army die. Andrew Pickens at the cow pens, and Continentals will be there. Meet Daniel at the cow pens, the old wagoner. There will be slaughter in the highlands if Daniel Morgan fails. The Carolinas will be lost if bloody Tarleton prevails. For the sake of wives and daughter, take rifle, shot, and powder. Mount your horse and ride toward the call which echoes louder. Come to the cow pens. Come to the cow pens. Would they come? They came in droves. They came by units. They came by individuals. And the night before the battle, with bitterly cold weather, no tents, they hunkered around campfires. And Morgan went from campfire to campfire. His Continentals already knew what they were to do, but he talked to the militia. And he is said to have told them rival stories. Um, he asked them to stand their ground and take two aim fires at the officers and NCOs, and then the battle would be won, and the old folks would praise them, and the young girls would kiss them. <laughs> he may have shown his back, which is uh, reported to have looked like the hide of an alligator, because in, law, in, Mer in uh, Morgan's long career, he had hit a British officer and hit them, hooked with a cat of nine tails until it is reported that the flesh in his office back hung in shreds and his boots were full of blood. He did not like British officers. Um, it's reported that he never went to bed that night, and that's possibly true. He suffered from rheumatism, sciatica, and hemorrhoids. <laughs> and the following day, he would command on horseback. But he was determined. I'll take this field tomorrow, or here my bones will lie. I'll win here, promised Morgan, or at the cow pens I will die. Early in the morning, when Tarleton finally came up the uh, Green River Road, he saw who rode ahead one militia unit, the Little River Militia. Surely Tarleton thought this is just a little delay in action while Morgan is trying to get across the Broad River and escape. But he sent some of his dragoons ahead to take a look. 
And as they approached, they realized that there were skirmishers on the right and the left, well forward of Little River Militia, and they fired. Uh, make every shot count, boys. See the troopers now skedaddle back to their fertile commander with many an empty saddle. Make every shot count, boys, and pray with every load. We'll make the British pay, boys, on the Green River Road. I now, according to John Robertson and Larry Babbins, <coughs> probably um, the skirmishers were within shooting distance of the British troops. Charlton had to make a decision. Should he withdraw and regroup or attack? And Morgan knew his man well. Charlton attacked. And with his troops, some of them still on the road, he formed a line and started forward with the British uh, shouts. Give them the Indian hello, boys, was Morgan's order to his men. And the shout rose along the line and echoed again and again. It should have given the British pause to hear that raucous cheer. Like Ferguson, they soon would know the yelling boys were here. Now the British regiments all lined up, uh, provincials and regulars. It would have been a beautiful sight. Men who had fought at Musgrove's Mill would have seen that kind of formation before. Maybe many of the other militia never had. What a lion it is before us, bright red and blue and green, marching forward into battle. It's a sight I've never seen along the Green River Road. And the militia suddenly was across in front of the British, and Bobby Moss and Larry Babbitt insist that there were a thousand militia on the field. Now, Morgan always said that a good rifleman could hit a British soldier at 300 yards. He could hit him in the head at 200 yards. And yet they stood there and waited as the British came. Now, in the past, Charlton had much experience in clearing the field of militia with bands. He evidently thought that this militia would turn and run. And they waited. And the thought that went along that line, and why did they obey Morgan? Well, John Robertson, who's quite a character, said, well, not only did they promise Morgan, but God heard them, and they're Presbyterian. <laughs> Come give me the order to fire. I have an officer in my sight. There'll be bloody British bodies on the Green River Road tonight. And the, finally, the militia fired. Many of them did not get off the second shot, but behind them were the Continentals who had yet to fire a shot or to, to suffer any casualties. The Continentals executed an on echelon movement, which allowed the um, militia to file off through those lines and to the back of the field. And now we have a set battle. As Karen mentioned it yesterday, you know, we all line up, ready, arm, fire, that sort of thing, both sides doing it. And then, uh, of course, both sides uh, exchanging volleys and, of course, the, the bayonets. Bayonets flashing, sabers crashing, horses thrashing, bones smashing along the Green River Road. Drums pounding, shots resounding, men screaming, blood streaming along the Green River Road. The British were not doing well, and Tarleton sent in his reserves, the 71st Highlanders, uh, probably one of the best trained units in the British Army. The squeal of, of Scottish bagpipes sends shivers down my spine. Their troops come charging forward close to our battle line. Like fiends from hell, they charge with Scots hands upon their head, wearing tartan towel trousers and jackets of bright 
blood red. They were attempting to turn the flank, and the order was evidently to face the flank, which means form an oblique to take care of those people come trying to come in on the side. And the order was misunderstood. And the Continentals at that end of the battle uh, field on the right side turned and started to retreat. And then everybody along the line, seeing them, thought the order had been given. They turned around and went uh, the move back. Morgan, on his horse, approached John Eager Howard. I would love to have a direct quote. Yes. Because I don't think he said, gentlemen, what do you think you are doing? <laughs> Morgan was rough, tough. He was a backcountryman. He was a rifleman. He was a carouser, a womanizer, a gambler, a drinker. Don't you just love a guy like that? <laughs> But John Eager Howard said, do you look, do we look like we are defeated? His troops were trailing arms and reloading as they moved. Um, Morgan picked out a spot in the field at a point at which the order would be given to turn, fire, and charge with bayonets. And that's what the Continentals did. And as they turned and plowed in to the Continentals, there was panic in the British line. Many fell on the ground uh, and surrendered. Some tried to run, um, and many threw their weapons. And that main line um, collapsed. But the 71st Highlanders continued to fight. And it took a bit of time. Charlton tried to send his uh, cavalry to the relief of the 71st, and they turned around and fled the field. They'd have enough of this. And eventually, the reform militia on one side, commanded by Andrew Pickens, and William Washington on the other side, and the 71st finally surrendered. They expected to all be killed because Tarleton had given the order to give no quarter. In other words, take no prisoners. If Tarleton had won that battle, it would have been bloodshed. The battle was over. Uh, Tarleton escaped with some of his mounted officers and some of his, his legionnaires, left the rest of the army on the field dead dying or prisoners. Morgan knew that he had to leave because Cornwallis would be in hot pursuit to try to destroy him. So he left immediately, leaving the battlefield to the militia. The bloody field of victory where late leaf soldiers trod, strewn with the wreckage of battle on the cold and bloody sod, here wounded in the dying, lay in the freezing mud. Can even the, he he the rains of heaven ever wash the blood from the Green River Road? The rest of that day and overnight, the militia buried over 200 men. Those graves have never been found, but the local militia did bury them, and they were gone the next day. So it was a very hurried burial, that is for sure. And you know from the race to the dam that Cornwallis never caught the Continental Army. Now, how do you finish a story like this? And, it, and I gave it a lot of thought. Now, wouldn't you think with all that carnage there ought to be a ghost or two? <laughs> Now, officially, there are no ghosts at the battle, at Calpin's battlefield. You ask the rangers, they'll tell you that. But Bob and I spent a lot of time up there, and a lot of the locals believe that it is haunted. 
And over the years, they've seen things, their grandpappy has seen things, and as they reported, there was quite a bit of similarity, and they all seemed to be focused on the same spot. We lived there in our motorhome for months at a time, and after the park was closed, we were there in the dark, and we never saw a ghost. But I just could not resist. In the bitter cold of winter on a clear and cloudless night, when the battlefield at Camden is bathed in pale moonlight, you can hear the sounds of battle. It's suffering once again. The screams of dying horses, the prayers of dying men. There are spirits here at Calpens, and those spirits do not sleep. They march the field forever for a vigil they must keep. keep meet Morgan at the Cowpens is a cry that will not cease in the hearts of men and women who still fight and die for peace. Today, when liberty is threatened and hate and violence rages, again, patriots answer a call like that which echoes through the ages. Come to the Cowpens. Come to the Cowpens. service and, and you know where poetry had a meter and a rhyme. I don't understand haiku and blank verse. <laughs> blank verse looks to me like very well written prose. I don't see it as poetry and, and that's just the product of my age and all that. But yes, um, for years I have just sort of messed around with that sort of thing. Well, that, that was that was a, a beautiful way to express what you wanted to. It was so well done. I just hard to believe that that was your your first effort in publishing that. Well, I've, I've never never published poetry, but but uh, and, 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 and as I said, the the voice, the patriot voice was speaking to me. I, I could you know, it was so easy to write because I could just hear that that's what he wanted to say. As I said. Pays to be exempted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is that column in your book? Comes from the Calpens. Yeah. It, yes, I was reading from 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 the book, Public Affairs. Yeah. By Hub City. But uh, yes, it, that's a spot. Also by Hub City, which is Dr. Ken's, um, the publisher. Also. 